Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue Fletch Mobility Roundup podcast. Today, I am uh, excited to be joined by Tim Kane. Tim is uh, with Zebra Technologies. Tim is actually, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Tim for, was over a decade now. I think you yeah. well, first met, I think it was like 2012. So it's it's coming up on on uh, on, on 11 years. Um, but Tim is a retail industry principal with Zebra. And I, I don't know if Tim, you, I think you could probably describe it better than me. You want to give your, your pitch of what, what you do and how you're helping out there? Sure. Yeah. My, my role at Zebra is to understand the, understand the major trends that are impacting the retail industry and then to spend time with our customers and partners talking about how those trends will impact the initiatives that they're involved in. So I get an opportunity to be in front of customers and partners all the time. It's great. I learn a lot from them and have the opportunity to share that uh, without being, you know, in, in violation of non disclosures, but <laughs> just sharing at a, a large level or a high level what they're doing. Yeah. And, and uh, just to put a little pitch in here for this. So I've been involved in a couple of these with different clients or different potential clients with Tim, where they brought us in to speak on security and the device experience style of things Blue Fletch does. And the Zebra does a really good job of bringing different teams and experts to talk through a lot of the questions that people have. And they're, they're seeing a lot of in retailers. So if you do have questions, definitely reach out to, to Tim and his team. Um, they're they're I, I can't, can't say enough about you guys, but it's awesome. Awesome to work with Great. you. Um, so for this discussion, I wanted to spend the next 30 minutes just going through, we had some questions on, um, the future of retail. So over the next year, potentially two or three years, what's going to happen, maybe even further out for some of the things you're seeing, um, really talking through those. And there's a couple of topics. I, I pulled my team internally of questions they had and, um, sent some things over to Tim and, um, came up with a list of a couple of topics that we think are relevant for, the state of retail technology and mobile technology and retail, where that's going to be over the next year. So we wanted to cover through that. And I guess the first one, before we hop into the future, Tim, you can talk a little bit about um, 2022. So what did what did you see in 2022, even 21, 22? What are the key trends you saw or the things that were um, really impacted retail from a, a technology or overall just retail standpoint? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the the trend actually did start in 2021, and it was all focused around the challenges that the retailers were having with labor, their ability to get labor, the ability to retain labor, to train labor. So the retailers, and as I said, I have an opportunity to meet with a lot of retailers, but the, the leaders, what they did was they aggressively started to give mobile devices to all their associates. And on the devices, and these were shared devices, it wasn't a device that the associate left the store with, but it was a shared device. And on the device, they were putting applications that would help the associate do their job better and, you know, be better with um, the customer, customer experience. Uh, one of the big ones, if you reflect back, you know, 18 months was just buy online, pick up in store. So, you know, the, the devices were being used in large part for that. But a trend that I'm starting to see emerging through the middle of this year and really gaining momentum is putting voice on the device and the ability to include voice for the associates. So I, I think that's the biggest trend that I saw in the last year, year and a half. With You mentioned that the productivity piece, and I, I think we've all read a lot about that there's it's more difficult to hire people you know, post the 2020 uh, COVID events. But are there, you know, with labor and productivity, were there things that that you saw as like the the biggest driver? Is just is it just not having enough people? Is that the the real key you're seeing? No, no, it's beyond that. Uh, first of all, it's it's not having people, and then unfortunately, the people that you're hiring aren't necessarily the people you would want to hire. So that presents a bigger challenge. And then the turnover rates have been higher than ever. So you know, you get associates in. Sometimes associates don't last a shift. But you bring somebody in, there's a cost associated with doing that. And then, you know, the, the frequent turnover. So if there's anything you can do, and this is what the smart retailers are doing, they're using the mobile devices really as a tool to create a more collaborative and inviting environment. So that that's one of the things that I've seen with them. And they're putting applications on there that really help the associate do their job better so that it's not something where they have to, you know, be, feel like they're on an island at some times. They always have the ability to communicate with somebody through the device. So a, a good segue to the next question I had, which is data and data analytics. So I know all these different apps they're starting to put on devices are, are feeding what's available out there, but 
for you guys, for Zebra, and then for the retailers you're working with, what are you seeing as trends around data analytics, around both mobile devices and the, the surrounding systems? Yeah, the um, data analytics is becoming more and more popular and more and more important. The idea that you can start to capture the data that you've had for years and start to use it productively so that you can make better decisions you know, in a shorter period of time. So we're starting to see a big uh, trend in that direction. Uh, Zebra has been aggressively going in that space. We have an investment arm at Zebra where we go out and we look for companies. And one of the companies that we're, one of the areas we're looking in is in the analytics area. So when you think about it, with everything changing so quickly and with technology being used more and more, the ability to take the data that you already have and make better decisions quicker with that data. Can you talk? I know Zebra, I think there's two big investment that you guys have made or bought acquiring companies or investing companies or partners. Like sure. What are what do those look like? Or what do you, what are you guys focused on with, with those investments? Okay, the first one I'm going to talk about is a company. We bought them about two years ago. And that was a company that did data analytics around front-end productivity and inventory. So we're starting to use that to help identify, you know, when stores are underperforming, why they're underperforming. And if you have cashiers that are having problems, you know, do they need more training or is there an issue there? So that that's something that we made investment in that we then we purchased the company and they're now actually Zebra Prescriptive Analytics. And then the other one is we recently bought a company, Intuit AI. And what Intuit AI does is Intuit AI does demand forecasting and they help you capture all the information that you need so that you can have the inventory in the right places at the right time. And if you think about it, if you're a chain that spans the United States, there are certain times of the year when you want inventory in the Northeast and certain times of the year where you want inventory in the Southwest. And Intuit will help you make sure that you put the inventory that you need where you need it when you need it. You're telling me uh, swimsuits don't sell well in uh, upstate New York in January? <laughs> Yeah, right now is not a good time. <laughs> uh, I, so data-wise, and, and you mentioned this the, the Zebra Venture Arms. I know you guys are looking at AI and ML, and I, I feel like there's been a lot of really interesting announcements in the last couple of months. Um, so open AI, open source GTP3, or not open source, but release their APIs around that. Um, what are where, where are you seeing AI and ML being applied in retailers? What's the time horizon for that? Is that right now? Is it next year? Is it five years out? I think we're still in the early stages. I think that we're starting to gather information and understand the value of the, the information. And it's gonna take time for the retailers to really land on how they're gonna effectively use that information. But it's something that there's a lot of focus right now and focus meaning investment dollars. So the investment dollars that the retailers are making in the, in the AI and ML space where they realize that in the past, we made decisions based on data and in many cases based on gut instinct. And a lot of those decisions weren't necessarily the best decision. So I think what's happening now is they're starting to understand that let's make more informed decisions. Let, let's make decisions that are being you know, run through where the data is really being run through an engine and an engine that's able to spit out information that will allow you to make a quicker and better decision. Yeah, I like how you phrase that, allow you to make a better and quicker decision. I, I'm always a little bit nervous when you let the machine machine make a decision on its own. <laughs> I, I've seen that be gamed by people, and it's definitely not a, not a good point. But I think <laughs> enabling enabling people or having the tools that that surface the data to you to make better decisions, I think, is a awesome way to go, even, even down at the associate level. Yeah, and, and that's a great point because um, the reality is that you know, we, we live in this fear that machines are going to take over everything, but you really need – the individual to really filter the information and to make sure that the information they're getting is going to work in, in their environment. Yeah. What was the, uh, um, I think there was a, a book, uh, flash boys. I don't know if you've ever seen this about the, oh, stock, the stock market yeah. crashes driven by they're using <laughs> analytics to do all the trades and yeah. it wasn't a human over human over, oversight. It, it, it effectively trended and crashed the market because it, it, was, yeah. it had no oversight from a, from a, a partner, a human partner, right? Yeah, so, uh, so definitely, definitely, definitely don't want that in their stores. Um, speaking of stores, so brick and mortar and physical stores, and I think at one point in time, everybody's like, you know, brick and mortar is going to go away, brick and mortar is dead. And then I feel like there's been a lot of shifts where now coming out of 
you know, a year or two after COVID, people are like, I want to be in a store. I want to see things and touch things. What what are you seeing? Are there trends around brick and mortar and how that's changing and how you think that's going to change over the next year, two or three years? Yeah, there are a few. And, and you made a good point that people left the stores when COVID started and now they're going back. And I think that the retailers are starting to realize that, okay, now that people are coming back, you know, how, how do we create an environment that is a good experience for the, for the customer? Um, I was at a conference recently and they listed the top three things that retailers are going to be doing going forward. And number three was customer experience that had dropped off over the last two or three years. When COVID came, customer experience was not at the top of the list. Survival was at the top of the list. But now the <laughs> the retailers understand that the customers are coming back into the store. So there's a, a few things they're doing. First of all, they're starting to try to figure out how do I make my online experience just as good as my in-store experience or vice versa, you know, which, whichever is better. They, they want to make sure that it's a seamless experience. And so there's a lot of work being done around that. When COVID came again, people put up buy online, pick up in store. And a lot of those were not very elegant. They were just, again, to, to survive. So now they're going back and they're trying to work on that to make sure that the digital experience is you know reflective of their in-store experience. And a lot of that also involves the associate, making sure that the associate in the store is able to really service the customer and give them a high degree of customer service when they come in. So those are the things that I'm starting to see. And it's encouraging to see that the focus is going back on let's get the customers in the store. Let's have a good experience. Let's make retail, let's make retail exciting again. Yeah, I love that. I know we, I think there was actually a client you and I worked on together. I think when they rolled out Bopis, they found, I think it was like 20% of the customers that came in to pick up an item of Bopis would stay to go shopping and would yeah. buy something else. So I, I think it's definitely use those online and e-commerce things to transition to people to physical stores. Now, I, I, one other question within the physical stores themselves um, is something that we heard a lot about, I think last year was a, a store as a distribution center. So being able to deliver from stores, what do you see or what have you seen? Is that working for people? What are the different things that work and don't work around using stores as, as a DC or, or micro fulfillment center? Yeah, that that's a really good topic. Um, the whole fulfillment process and especially the delivery is a challenge and retailers lose money on the delivery part. So there are a few things they're trying to do. First of all, they're trying to understand you know, what can we do to make it more efficient and to at least break even. And they're experimenting with a lot of different things, that, you know, shipping from store. So that, that makes sense for a lot of retailers because they have stores across the country. And if they set up an environment where they can make sure they're shipping at the least shipping costs, that helps. The other thing you mentioned is the micro fulfillment center, the idea of taking either space inside of a store and grocery has done this really well where they'll cover out some space, maybe 10,000 square feet in the back room and they'll put the center store items there. So they'll put the, the paper paper towels, they'll put the cereal, they'll put the canned goods and online fulfillment orders will be done through that. And then the fresh stuff will be picked by the associates. So that's another way to try to uh, reduce the cost of fulfillment. Some have set up a, a hub and spoke where they'll have a central facility that will use you know, automation and then they'll disperse all the online orders out to you know, maybe a 10 mile radius. And then probably the biggest one as far as the size is Kroger has set up these um, huge, what they call sheds that are 300,000 square foot fully automated centers where they will deliver for up to a 200 mile radius. But it, it's all focused on how do we reduce cost and deliver the product immediately because we've become pretty <laughs> impatient as a society. <laughs> we don't want to wait two days for it to deliver anymore. We we prefer to have it in thirty minutes. <laughs> yeah, th thanks Amazon for ruining it for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, with that concept, I you call it a shed. I've I've typically heard it referred to as a dark store, but a store that yeah. doesn't have doesn't have customers in it. So that's not dark, but it's it's a a store that is designed as a micro fulfillment center. Is that something that you you see people still investing in even post COVID? That didn't work, and I'm not really sure why. I don't know whether it was something that they um, didn't give enough time to try it. But overall, that concept came up early on in COVID, and it made a lot of sense because 
if you think about it, if you had a dark store where you weren't going to have customers, you didn't have to set it up as a normal grocery store. You could set it up whatever made sense for picking quickest. But for some reason, that that didn't work. And I, I don't know why, but um, they did try it. And who knows, that might come back again. I, f- I feel like people try it every every 10 years. I think it was uh, 20, yeah. it was, two, it was 2000, was it 1999 or 2000 web van? I don't know if you remember those guys, George Shaheen. Yeah. And a bunch of oh, yeah. Folks. Like, I think they went through $6 billion and uh, a bunch of dark stores and it, it didn't work out. It was definitely too early for that one. If, right. 20, 20 years later, it might, might finally work, but yeah, maybe, maybe 2030, we'll see it working. Right. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Um, uh, on the the topic of mobility, you, you touched on this earlier, but um, you know, mobility is definitely moved a lot more into retailers. Um, yeah, you know, both um, grocery, the the small format retailer, specialty retailers. If, if somebody re- if retailer comes to you and says, "Tim, what are the the three things we should go do for mobile to improve our our stores and our employee and customer experience?" What, what would be the areas you would tell them to focus on, or you would you give them guidance on? Sure. The um, the first thing I would encourage them to do is make sure that the UI is good and you know, a touch UI that looks good, that the customer, that the associate can understand, that they can navigate. If if you don't do that, and, and it sounds so simple, but if you don't do it, they're not going to use the device. So it, it's almost like, why bother? And and then the other thing that I would do with the with the device is I would do training for the associates and I would do like 30, 60, 90 second videos that they can do on, you know, in the aisle at the store. Um, you know, there are companies out there that will offer that and they'll actually keep track of the associates to see how they're doing and make sure that they're, they're doing the, um, the training that they need. And then the other thing that I really think is important is um, voice. I think voice is, I'm seeing a, a tremendous trend in real solid movement in putting voice on the device so that you have one device that does everything. You don't have to carry a walkie talkie. You don't have to carry a phone. You can carry it all in one. And voice gives you so many options. It can be the push to talk like the walkie talkie, or it can be, you know, through a PBX where you can get an extension on it. So those are the three areas that I would encourage the retailers to really explore as they start to increase the number of mobile, mobile devices for the associates. And with those, you sort of touched on this earlier, do you see these mobile devices replacing workstations or desktops in stores where they're just putting all the apps employees need on a mobile device? Is that is that a trend you're seeing out there at all? Starting to see it. And something that I'll give a, a bit of a, a plug for Zebra is we've actually built a piece of hardware, which is... Um, a little cradle you can drop the device, our, our mobile device, our TC52 into, and it can turn it into a workstation. So all, all you need is the screen. And the TC52 is powerful enough to run a workstation. We've done the work on it to um, display everything you would have on a workstation and make sure that the you know the ratio is right and everything fits there. So I, I think that that device coupled with our mobile devices is going to go a long way to eliminating workstations in the stores. Yeah. And we've, I know from blue Fletch side, we we've, we've seen, I think we had two big customers use that zebra workstation connect product. And it's, it's interesting. Yeah. You just drop a device in and then, you know, effectively reconfigures, we reconfigure for layout for the right size and all the apps yeah. and effectively becomes a, a, a desktop for you. So um, I'll, I'll be interested to see how that, that progresses in the next few years. Um, one of the other things I know Zebra, and you mentioned the Zebra Ventures before, the in- investments you guys have made. One of the big investments I've seen has been around robots. And I know from right. a supply chain stamp- standpoint, robots are big in the warehouse. So they, they replace certain activities that are repetitive, like dunnage and some other things. But on the, the retail side, are you starting to see robots coming in retail? Are there, are there any clients or wins you guys have had? And then do you see anything in 2023 being uh, being big with the robots? I think robots in the stores are still years away. I, I, I don't think that we're going to see, we'll see retailers try them and with varying degrees of success. The one retailer who I have to give credit to is Schnucks. They're a grocery out of St. Louis and they have a, a robot in the store. They've had it there for a long time. They've been very, very patient in kind of bringing it along to do, right now they do out of stocks with it. Um, but they have other ideas of what they'll use it for. But they've really, to their credit, they've stuck to it and they've 
put a, a lot of effort and a lot of um, investment into that. I haven't seen any other retail that's been tremendously successful with robots. I, I think that, again, I think they'll continue to experiment with, experiment with them, and I hope they do because I think it's something that could be beneficial. But with one of the things with robots, and I do have some personal experience in this area, is that... Um, Hopefully it's good. It, well, <laughs> good it, and bad. In, in theory, <laughs> they're... They're they're really great, and you can give all the benefits they're going to give. But then, as we and with so so many other technologies, when you get into the store, <laughs> things that you never expected pop up, and, and you have to be able to overcome some of the things you weren't expecting. And that's that's what Schnucks has done to their credit. You know, they they put the robot in, and every day was a new learning experience because there were things that nobody expected to see in the store that are there. <laughs> so. For for companies that are looking to invest in robotics or try things out, what's the what's the process you would advise them on or give them guidance on how to go try robots or try robotics? I would um, first of all find someone that you think is a really good partner and somebody that is going to stay with you and invest with you in the process. And then the next thing I would do is um, create some realistic expectations. You know, what, what is it that you want to solve? And, you know, is this the best way to solve it? And so that's the way I would start out. I, I'd start out, you know, little gains are important, but it's, it's important to understand, you know, what do I really want to do with this? And and is the, the robot the best way to, to accomplish that? Yeah, that's good, good advice. Uh, be realistic. Um, speaking yeah. of realistic, uh, uh, this is a, this is another far out topic. AR, so augmented reality and VR, so virtual reality. Is it still hype? Is it legit? Like, what's what are you seeing out there? Is there anybody being successful with AR or VR um, from either an associate or uh, consumer standpoint? I haven't seen anybody successful with it right now in, in a large scale. We, Zebra, we, we're experimenting with it and we have been for a few years and we have some amazing demos that are really, really exciting. But, <laughs> but we haven't gotten to the point where it has um, taken hold in the store. I, I think it will just because it's such a powerful tool. But I, I think in many ways, like the robot, it has to be the right combination. You have to get the right retailer with the right partner and the right mission that they want to they want to solve, um, and I just I think we're still a ways away from from that becoming mainstream in retail. Yeah, so don't don't go uh, do it just for technology's sake. Actually, go right. after go after a problem to go solve. Yeah, I was general general good advice. <laughs> Um, the next area of question we had for you was around privacy versus productivity. And this is something that's, we, you know, there's the the example of, I, I want an experience that's catered to me. When I walk in a store or when I talk to somebody, I want them to know at least some context of me. But at the same time, I don't want the super creepy where people know everything about me and uh, are, are, are checking in on me. And it feels like big brother's watching. Like, how, how do retailers think about that balance and um, what what should we expect to see around privacy versus productivity over the next next two to three years? I think the retailers understand the, the delicate situation that they're in. And I think they're doing everything they can to protect the consumer while build their business. Uh, it's hard. You know, GDPR in, in Europe, where, you know, the, the privacy rights of the consumer are very strong. And I think we're going to start to see some of that. We already are seeing some of that in, in the United States, but I think we're going to see more of that. We're, you know, protecting the rights of the of the consumer and the whole opt-in environment. Um, but again, the, the retailers, they want to capture as much information as they can about you and use that in a way that will encourage you to be a loyal customer and encourage you to you know, buy more. So they're, they're going to continue to use the information that they, that they can. I, I do think, you know, I, I think they'll do it in a, in a smart way. I, I, I'm not concerned that they're going to do something that's going to be so outlandish that it's going to cause them harm because it's, it, it could really hurt. It could really hurt a major retailer or any retailer if they do it 
incorrectly. Yeah, I can see that. And um, uh, on the the thread of of challenges, when you know thinking about big challenges people are facing with all these new technologies, things coming in, what what do you think within the retail industry the biggest challenges they're going to see in the next three to ten years? Like, what are the the big sea changes to be concerned about or, or to think through as a retailer? Okay, um, I think I think they already exist and they're and they're going to continue to be challenges. And we've talked a little bit about them as labor is going to continue to be a challenge and you know we're in a situation where there isn't enough labor and you know the retailers are trying to get labor and unfortunately in many cases they're hiring people that they would rather not have to hire um so i think around labor what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to figure out how do we create an environment that's going to be welcoming to associates that's going to make them want to stay here and that's going to make them as productive as we can possibly make them. So so I think they really need and, and this is where mobility helps. You know, I, I think they really need to lean on mobility to make sure that the the apps that the associates get are apps that are going to make them more productive and they're going to be easy to use. They're going to get training on the apps. Um, you know, the idea that retail has always been a high turnover. And it's higher now than it's ever been. So, you know, you hire somebody and sometimes they don't even make it through the first shift and you're, you're rehiring them. So there's a tremendous cost associated with that. Um, then the other thing is, you know, how, how do you get your team to work together? So you, you need to create a collaborative environment. So I think that that's something that is, you know, the whole labor thing's going to be an issue for a while. The next thing is inventory and inventory is, um, is an issue now. Uh, I, was on a call earlier today. They were talking about, you know, we're coming toward the end of the year and many retailers are just fat with inventory and they carry much more inventory that they wanted for all the right reasons. You know, the supply chain was broken. So they overordered. you know, people were buying with stimulus checks. So they perhaps made a bad decision as to that's where AI might've helped them. <laughs> <laughs> AI might've said, well, you know, this is not going to happen <laughs> every year <laughs> um, or maybe AI got them into that position. But um, inventory is going to continue to be a challenge. And I think that with um, online growing as much, that that creates even a bigger challenge for inventory because you have to make sure that you're filling your orders that are coming in online and you have product on the shelf when people come into the store. So I think those two will be will continue to be big challenges moving forward. I, I don't see anything that's going to fix that quickly. Yeah, so that on the second one, the inventory one, I feel like there was a, a period of time where nobody had inventory and that was the problem. Now you're saying people have too much inventory. What is, is supply chain fixed in general? Do you think the supply chain problems have been sorted out where we've, we've, we've figured out what's going on there? There are some things that have happened over the last couple of months, which are um, so really surprising to me. And first of all, the, the ports are back to normal. So they're, they're, they can take the shipments that come in. Um, there's been a big shift that the imports from China have been surpassed by the imports from Europe. So we're starting to get more product out of Europe than we are out of China. And part of the China problem is that COVID still is a mess over there. And they're really struggling with that and the lockdowns and all that. But it gave you know Europe a great opportunity to we would import to export more to us. Um, the person talking about this was saying, and the um, products coming out of Europe are higher priced than the ones coming out of China. So, you know, I, I guess as consumers, we're going to pay more. Maybe we're going to get higher quality products that should help retailers, you know, improve margins. But uh, I think those two things are are still out there that, that we have to contend with. So I I don't know that the supply chain is fixed but it's certainly better than it was a year ago. Yeah, it's good, good, good feedback. From a, a standpoint of spending in 2023, are, are there areas where you think companies are going to spend the most? Like if you had to advise somebody, they, you know, we're setting our budget for the upcoming year. So, you know, fiscal year for most retailers ends the end of January. Like what, where would you, where do you see companies starting to look at investing and spending money in both technology or, or other areas? Yeah, I, I think in retail, there's going to be continued spend on associate productivity. So 
you know, I have seen many retailers say that we're going to make sure that every associate has a device. So there'll be the spend on the device. And then in order to make those devices really work and improve the productivity and the customer, and, and, you know, customer shopping experience, there's going to be apps that have to be added to the device. So there'll be a lot of spend there. And I, I think the leading retailers are going to continue to spend there. Um, the other area where I'm seeing a tremendous amount of investment is analytics. And you know, we, we touched on this a couple of times, the idea that, you know, get the machines to make the decisions based on the data as opposed to making a, a, a gut decision. So I'm seeing a lot of investment from the retailers and Zebra is invested in that area as well. But um, I think analytics where you can start to take the data that you have, because we all know that retailers probably have more data than any other industry out there and take the data that you have and use that in a way that's really going to help you drive your business and improve the customer experience, improve loyalty, you know, increase the spend of the customer, um, you know, run, run your stores at a, a leaner inventory level, yet offering everything you need to offer. So the shelves are always stocked. So I, I think analytics will be an, a way for the retailer to, to get to that. And, and I think the retailers are going to spend in that space. Is that the same across big retailers versus small retailers? Like where is that the is that the, the same advice you give to, to most segments? Yeah, I, I would I would give the advice to everybody and the way that I would um the way I kind of segregated it in my mind is you have the leaders and the leaders, you know, we think of the leaders as as the biggest companies, but there are a lot of smaller companies who from a technology standpoint are leaders. And they're doing some exciting things with technologies. They're running their business. They just don't happen to be five hundred billion dollar companies. You know, they're you know a billion, two, three billion dollar company that is really leading edge by any any way you look at it. But then there's the laggards, and the laggards they're always there. They they'll always continue to be there. You know, can I squeeze two more years out of this old laptop? And you know, it's just they unfortunately. You know, for them, I, I I think they're they're gonna the gap's gonna increase, and you know the the leaders are going to you know widen the gap and take more share if if you're not willing to invest. Yeah, I think that it's like Amazon has been been pushing everybody in that direction the last couple <laughs> of years, the last these last twenty years almost. Right. Um, so in summary, um, you know, invest in mobile devices. Look at how you can optimize the experience for your employees. And then think about the analytics and data you're using. So those are the big three areas you think people should be spending on in 2023. Yeah, yeah, and I think we'll see that. Awesome, um, Tim. I, I know we went through a lot of questions really fast here. I really appreciate your your guidance and advice. But if somebody's looking for um, to find more from from Zebra, where would they go? How would they get in touch with you or your team? Sure. Yeah, um, we have a website zebra.com, and in that website there are a lot of different you know, opportunities, tabs that you can click on. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's one in there that talks about our retail business. Um, and that that's the best place to get more information. If if you're going to be at NRF, we have a booth there. And, um, you know, we're usually pretty busy at the booth, but it's a great opportunity to stop by and see what we're doing. And, you know, if you if you haven't already signed up with your account manager for a booth tour, you, you should probably do that. Yeah, I, I second that. Zebra does a, a great job with their uh, NRF show every year. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing it this year. Um, Tim, thanks again. Really appreciate you being on the show. And uh, for everybody out there uh, watching or listening, um, if you have questions, feel free to email bluefletch at info at bluefletch.com. And as always, uh, feel free to like or follow our podcast or show. And uh, best luck to everybody into 2023. Thank you again, Tim. Thanks, Brett. Good talking to you. Thank you for listening to the Enterprise Mobility Roundup podcast. If you enjoyed the discussion, please take a few moments to rate us. If you'd like to listen to future episodes, please subscribe. To learn more about mobility topics or submit any questions, visit us at bluefletch.com.